Hey, hey, good evening, everybody. You guys well? Come on, let me hear you. Yay! Okay, that's so awesome. All right, so just remember, get your tickets for Significance Run. It's going to be amazing. And then celebration. Remember the last week of September, not the first week of October like it usually is. It's a week earlier because it coincides with the, the school holiday. So, uh, guys, it's going to be amazing, amazing, amazing. 45 years of ministry. Praise the Lord. So, let me quickly pray. Uh, not quickly, let me pray and first of all thank uh, Apostle Theo and Dr. Bev for the privilege and the honor to preach and to teach tonight. Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus. Now make it known that I do not trust in myself, but I trust in you, Spirit of God. Now teach through me. Let the word go forth, changing each and every heart. I pray in Jesus' name. And in advance, I will give you all the praise and all the glory in Jesus' name. And all those who agreed said... Amen. Praise the Lord. Are you guys ready for the book of Daniel? Amen. Do you know where it is in the Bible? <laughs> there was less people at that stage, okay? You just go to Ezekiel. It's the next one. Uh, after Hephaniah. So once you find Hephaniah, have you heard of Hephaniah? No, there's no such book in the Bible. In any case, all right. So um, I'm so excited about the message tonight because uh, in week, uh, this is part four of our series, the book of Daniel, and uh, tonight's message is the fire inside. Let me make a statement up front so I can get you revved up. The fire on the inside has got to be bigger than the fire on the outside. Okay? The fire, say that with me. The fire on the inside must be bigger than the fire on the outside. Amen. So in other words, your circumstances cannot overcome you or shouldn't overcome you because if they do, that means there's no fire on the inside. Amen. And that's what we're going to be talking about. So uh, this is part four of our series, The Fire uh, on the Inside. And let me just recap uh, and on uh, week one or part one, Pastor Jenny spoke about truth and grace. And she spoke about the fact that uh, we, used to, uh, we have to use tact and grace and truth when we, especially in a situation where things could be difficult, when we're in a different organization or a company or a country, or in the case of Daniel, he was a prisoner really. He was a prisoner in that country, but entrusted with, with a, lot of, a lot of things. So he had to use truth and grace to really win over the heart of the king. And then in week two, we see Pastor Greg spoke about all those names yesterday, all right? And I mean, and how... The king on purpose changed their names so that their identity potentially could have been changed. And isn't that what is happening in the world today? Amen. I mean, people have now got the name Lotus and Storm. And what, what, what is with that? Okay. And then all of a sudden, Peter is now Pietro and stuff like that. What the heck is up with that? Okay. I don't know either. Okay. But this must stop. <laughs> We're not even in the message yet. We're getting ready, okay? Are you guys ready? You better stir that fire within, all right? And then in week three, Pastor Andre spoke to us about that we got to shine our light. So we might be in the midst of, of a place, and like Daniel, I mean, here he is. I mean, he's been put on the spot to say, if you don't interpret the, the dream that I have and tell me what it means, then chop your head and you guys are gone, all right? And how we can shine our light in a society and in a culture where there is no light. And isn't it amazing, family, that to a great extent, there's a huge similarity. What happened 2,800 years ago is happening today still. Amen? Nothing has changed. There's nothing new under the sun, Ecclesiastes tells us. So we see very, very clearly that these things existed 2,800. It's not a new thing. It's just been packaged perhaps differently or we're just perceiving it differently, all right? So I'm saying again, the fire on the inside has to be bigger than the fire on the outside, all right? So let's start with our founding scripture and let me quickly orientate you as to everything that's happening here. In the third year of the reign of Joachim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. So let me just stop there there. Quickly, a little a bit of a history lesson here. This is the year 605 BC. This is the first of three 
attempts or times that King Nebuchadnezzar came to Israel, or to, sorry, not to Israel, to Judah, the kingdom of Judah, and wanted to overpower them. In actual fact, Judah, the kingdom of Judah was a vassal to the kingdom of Babylon. And so they had to comply with the rules and regulations of the king of Babylon. So in 605, because they broke covenant with, 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 with Nebuchadnezzar, he comes and he takes, in 605, the first time, he takes Daniel and the three other Hebrew boys and perhaps many others. The purpose is to take away the clever ones so that the nation can go low. It can never rise. It's the same thing when we talk about um, there's a brain drain in a country. There's a brain drain in an organization. You've got to be careful when that happens. It means that that organization, that country, will never be able to lift itself up because there's nobody with brains. Exactly. Okay? So in 605, the first time Daniel was taken, 18 years before the fall of the southern kingdom, 18 years before the end of the first temple period, 18 years before the destruction of the temple. This was not the destruction yet. He just took, because he said, you guys are too clever. You're working out plans not to pay me tribute. So I'm going to take away some of these clever oaks and assimilate them. That's maybe why I gave them those names. Because they were too clever for themselves. Amen? All right? Now this was the Lord's doing. To take them into exile. The exile hasn't started yet, but they were taken from their country to a different country. Look at what it says here. And the Lord gave Joachim king of Judah, into the hand with some of the articles of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Sinar to the house of his God, Nebuchadnezzar. So we can see here because what happened was that the king was not, did not observe his covenant with Nebuchadnezzar. Can you believe it? An unholy covenant. That's why the Lord gave, them, gave, gave uh, Judah into the hands of Nebuchadnezzar. Because they did not uphold the covenant. In other words, they had to pay tribute, all right? And goes on to say, and he brought the articles into the treasure house of his God. This is now in Babylon. Then the king instructed Aspenaz, the master of the eunuchs, to bring some of the children of Israel, so here it is again, and some of the king's descendants and some of the nobles, young men in whom there was no blemish but good-looking, gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge and quick to understand. In other words, the clever ones work for me who had the ability to serve in the king's place, and who they might teach the language and the literature of the Chaldeans. In other words, they wanted to assimilate them. What does the word assimilation mean? It means to make them think the way we think, not the way they think or used to think. Does it make sense? How many of us today in this woke environment is being assimilated without you even knowing it? You've been told that it's fine when a man walks around with short hair and bald with a dress. Come on, I can't believe it. I watched that thing on TV. It's ruined my whole day, weekend. Huh? How many of you know? Well, I'm not, you guys have been assimilated. You don't even know it. Oh, well, it wasn't too bad. No, you, you need to wake up. <laughs> Amen. Okay. Goes on here to say, and the king appointed to them a daily portion of the king's del delicacies and of the wine which they drank and three years of training for them, so that at the end of that time they might serve before the king. Now from among those of the sons of Judah were Daniel, Haniah, Mishael, and Azariah. So here we can see the four Hebrew boys were taken to Babylon. That's our founding scripture for the book of Daniel. It's based on the fact that they were there and put in them to, to senior positions so that they could serve the kingdom of Babylon. Now, what is important here also to note is that there was 120 prefects, satraps, um, lawgivers, whatever you would like to call them, politicians, prime ministers, whatever you would like to call them. And Daniel was one of three that overlooked, managed the 120. So he had a senior position. 
So when we look now at chapter number two and, uh, sorry, chapter number three, we see here that Nebuchadnezzar then thought, let me just give you the history, the background quickly. He, he, he thought it will be a good thing if he makes uh, uh, um, a statue of gold and at a certain time when certain music played, he wanted everybody to bow down. The Bible says everybody was present. All the governors, all the satraps, all the prime ministers. That means that Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah was there. The Bible goes on to say then, so when the sound came for them to bow down, these three, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, did not bow down. So where was Daniel? Now, we can speculate about that, but because he had a senior position, perhaps he was out of town on business. Maybe he was busy attending to a matter, but he was not present at that time, and these three Hebrew boys were all by themselves at this place. So they didn't have Daniel, our connection in government, to help them. They didn't have Daniel to help them and say, hey, oh king, please be lenient on these guys. These guys had to stand on their faith, not on their pastor's faith, not on their friend's faith, not on Jerry Savelle's faith, not on Kenneth Copeland's faith, on their own faith. Amen? Now let's go on. So now that they did that, they refused to bow down. I can imagine what was going through their head. It says that Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, these are the new names, Meshach and Abednego. And his attitude changed towards them. In other words, they were favored previously. But because they didn't want to bow down, his attitude changed towards them. How many of you are perhaps in a company, and the minute they hear that you're a Christian, all of a sudden the favor changes, all right? All of a sudden you're not the lacquer oak anymore. All of a sudden they drink their double Cokes and Cokes with ice separately from you. Because perhaps they feel in convicted, perhaps they feel a little bit, um, you know, and all of a sudden when they're making plans, we're going to go out tonight or we're going to go play golf and then we have a, a quick toot here and there and there. You're not part of those plans. Amen? I mean, you know what I'm talking about. Do you guys work? All right? We work in church, okay? Whatever, all right? But I mean, in corporate, this happens. How many of you in a senior position in corporate? It's the grace of God. <laughs> the fire inside needs to be bigger than the fire on the outside. There are some of you, let me just start preaching now. There's some of you that are happy to be in the fire all the time and there's no fire on the inside in your belly. And you need to start getting the fire on the inside and it's gotta be bigger than the fire on the outside. So in other words, he said, I'm not going to let you guys disobey me. So he ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual, commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie them up, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and throw them into the blazing furnace. So these men, wearing these robes, trousers, turbans, and other clothes, were, were bound and thrown into the blazing fire. The king's commander was so urgent and the furnace was so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The guys that's going to accuse you that wants to get you to hang, and they're going to be like the Hamans of the world, but these guys are going to be killed by their own problems, by their own challenges, by the very thing that they want to set you up with. You've got to make sure the fire on the inside is greater than the fire on the outside. Otherwise, you are going to get burned. Stay out of the kitchen if it's too hot. Yeah. Are you guys ready for this? Okay. All right, let's go. Fell into the blazing furnace, then King Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, weren't they three men that we tied up and then threw into the fire? Then King Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement. Oh, okay, he just said that, okay. All right, he said it again. He was so amazed. Let me just say it again, okay. They replied, certainly your majesty, he said, because all these guys now, they can't wait for your demise. They can't wait for these three Hebrews. I mean, whew, when Daniel comes back, they're gone. They replied, certainly your majesty, he said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire unbound and unharmed, and the fourth one looks like a son of the gods. 
There's another in the fire. Amen, family. Standing next to me. Praise the Lord. I'm not going to start singing. That's Pastor Andre's cue, okay? He's the singer nowadays, all right? Okay? Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High, Nochal. Because these guys are unfaced. They didn't say, okay, listen, guys, sorry, 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 sorry. You know, a little bit too hot today. Full, uh, I, I don't feel it. I don't feel it today. Can we just hold back? Okay, wherever, where do we bow? Just tell me and I'll do it. Maybe it's a simple thing as, hey, we're going to pay those guys a bribe. You've got to be the guy that's going to pay the bribe. You've got to do this. You see, I'm getting touchy now because that's why I'm seeing, I can just feel, ooh, Pastor Johnny. Servants of the Most High, immediately when he saw this, he realized there's something going on. These guys are not affected by the fire. These guys are, the fire on the outside is not consuming them. It's the fire on the inside that is greater than the fire on the outside. Are you with me, family? Amen. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire without a singe, nothing. All the satraps, prefects, governors, and royal advisors crowded around. They wanted to see what happened to these guys, right? They saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was their hair or their heads singed, their robes and everything. They, they smelled like a bed of roses, okay? And then Nebuchadnezzar said, praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Sometimes family, we have to go into a, through a fire for the world to see the power and the majesty of God. Amen? But you know what? When you get persecution at work, Lord, Pastor Johnny, pray for me to leave this company. A greater opening for me, Lord, thank you. I'm waiting for an open door. Stay there in the fire, but make sure that the fire on the inside is greater than the fire that you're in. Amen? That's your calling. That's your job. Don't run away. Like Daniel? No, I'm only kidding. Okay? Sent his angel and rescued his servants. You see, God will never put you in a situation where, where he will not deliver you out from. If the fire is greater on the inside, then the fire on the outside doesn't matter. So it goes on to say they trusted him and defied the king's commandments and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any God except their own. Therefore, I decree that the people of any nation and language who say anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego will be cut into pieces. Their homes will be turned into piles of rubble for no other God can save in this way. Amen? So here in Daniel 3, we see a couple of valuable lessons that we can learn from this. The first one is, Faithfulness under pressure. That today is a rare quality. Faithfulness under pressure. The minute the pressure is applied, we flip flop. Faithfulness is not just a word. It's an action. It's a verb. It's a do thing. You, you are faithful. Are you with me, family? I'm looking to you guys on this side here. All right? Just because... Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego remained faithful to God despite the threat of death. Faithfulness under pressure. When last were you under pressure because of your faith in God? When last were you persecuted? Now, I'm not saying go out and say, give it to me, hit me with it, okay? All right? But when last were you persecuted? You should remain faithful under pressure. You're not yet in the fire. Make sure that the fire within is greater than the fire on the outside. Amen, family. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, I love this. We have no need to answer you in this matter. Why are you guys up down? We have no need to answer you. We're guilty. You're right. We're not going to bow down. Okay, but now listen what they say. If that is the case, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, I love that. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, very, very respectful, like we learned in session number one, all right? So I'm not gonna say, who do you think you are? Nebuchadnezzar, Babylonian dude, whatever thing, you know, we're not gonna bow down. 
very respectful. Let it be known, O king, okay, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. Amen? So here we see family. It's amazing. Faithfulness under pressure. Goes on to say, number two, trust in God's sovereignty. So in other words, they trusted God to deliver them, but also accepted his sovereignty if he chose not to. In other words, even if God will not deliver me, I'm still not going to bow down to your idol. I'm telling you now, God will deliver me, but if he doesn't, I won't bow down. How many of us, when we feel the pressure, do we chop and change perhaps the way our values, our, what it is that we believe in or our, our position on the matter? How many times do we chop and change on this? Amen? The Bible says a man's heart plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. God guides us in the way that we should go. Number three, courage in the face of adversity. They showed remarkable courage in the face of certain death. Courage, I heard the other day, is really doing something, or it's even though you're fearful, is to do the thing that you fear. That's courage. Okay? So in other words, courage. They, 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 they didn't go in, whatever, hey, like a nice and warm stove, no, whatever. No, they must probably felt it a little bit there. But they knew the fire on the inside is bigger than the fire on the outside. So therefore, they had courage in the face of adversity. Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous and of good courage. Do not be afraid, do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Number four, the power of prayer. The power of prayer. Family, this ministry, if you've wondered, I wonder what the values are of this church. What are they built on? How did this church, this church is built on the power of prayer. And we're going to restore that because soon we are starting with 21 days of prayer. But let 21 days of prayer not be the only time that you pray. Because otherwise there's no power that you have in your life. There is power in prayer. This ministry is built on the power of prayer. I wonder how many things have been overted, prevented, because we prayed. You need to pray. Look what it says here. Okay? Their prayer and faith led to a miraculous de deliverance because confess your treasures about to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Not vain babblings over coffee or without direction. You will pray with your natural mind and you will pray with your spirit. Know what you're praying and interceding for. While I'm intercessor, rabba ba ba ba. I'm clapping everybody tonight, including myself. Okay? Is that okay with everybody? We need to be, you want to go in the fire? You need to be serious about it. Amen, family? Come on, can I hear a great amen there? Yeah. All right, okay, good. I just want to make sure I'm in the right house, okay? All right? Amen. Number five, God's presence in trials. Or God's presence in trials. God was with them in the fiery furnace, symbolizing his presence in our trials. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. I am with you always to the end, okay? For me to die is gain. In other words, even if they were to die in the furnace, we're going to heaven. Amen? All right? God's presence is always his presence. I know sometimes, most of the times, many times, we feel that when we're in a trial, when we're in the fire, when we're in the furnace, we feel like we are all alone. But I want you to know that God is with you. He is present in your trial. And you might say, but why is he not delivering you? Because God is sovereign. <laughs> sometimes we have to go through trials. I know this doesn't now make for nice, good teaching. You always just want to hear, okay, problem delivered, problem delivered. No, sometimes problem, more problems, very problems, huge problems. When is it going to end problems? Okay, and then God comes through. 
I've seen it in my own life. You see, because I think God waits for that fire to be stirred, that it can outgrow the fire in the trial, that you no longer focus on the fire on the outside, but rather focusing on the fire on the inside. Are you guys with me, family? Okay. Look what it says here. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. It will not over, you, you might be losing your house, losing your car, all your credit in, in, the, in your life. You might be losing family members, people passed away, people leaving, whatever it might be. I'm telling you now, he will not allow any circumstance to overflow you. And when you walk through the fire... You shall not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch you. Amen, family. What a promise to hold on to. But I want you also to know that there's foolishness, the foolishness of idolatry. If your faith is based on what your husband does in the mornings, you've made your husband an idol. If, if, if you must first have your coffee before you can pray. Now, I'm not a, a, against coffee now, okay? All right, so just work with me here. But if you say, yes, I can't pray until the coffee. Your coffee is maybe then an idol in your life, okay? And if there, and if there, and listen, let me just tell you. If you want to, now I'm looking for a lacquer song on, on Spotify. When you open that phone, it's a goner. 30 minutes later, you're still looking for a song. How many of you know what I'm talking about? I don't see, come on, is there anybody that was going to dare just put up their hand there? I'm just going halfway, Pastor Johnny, just halfway, okay? Just program it the night before and just press play when you get there or something. Or, hey, 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 here's a novel idea. What about a silent prayer? That's why it's called Silent Night. No, I'm only kidding. Okay. The foolishness of idolatry. The story highlights the foolishness, family, of worshiping idols and the futility of human efforts against God's people. Their plans will not succeed. It, you might be overcome, but it will not succeed. All right? Look what the Bible says. Their idols are silver and gold. They work the work of men's hands. They have, no, they have mouths, but they do not speak. Eyes they have, but they do not see. They have ears, and they do not hear. Noses, and they do not smell. They have hands, but they do not feel, or they do not handle. Feet that they have, but they do not walk. So in other words, it's all just fertility. Amen? Number seven. Band, come up. Number seven, the importance of unity. Now, this is for me the amazing thing. Even though Daniel was not present, these guys say, man, we, 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 we're not going to bow down to that gold image, but we are going to stand together. We are going to pray every day. I will lift up my face to the Lord, and I will pray to God Almighty and not to any statue, okay? The importance of unity, and that's what the three Hebrew boys did. Every day they would do that. And so there was unity in their prayer. Because Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stood together, demonstrating strength of unity in faith. We need to stand together as a church in the unity of prayer and of faith. Intercessors, you need to stand together in the strength of unity in faith. And the intercessor said, Okay. The Bible says, again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they shall ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. In other words, there is, you, there is, there is power in unity. We know that. There is power in corporate prayer. That's why Thursday or Tuesday nights, it's important that we get together to pray. But also in your own time, intercessors, we need your prayers. We covet your prayers. All the way from Apostle Theo, the church, the leaders of this church, you, our leaders, you that lead everybody. We need the prayers. But I want to know that there's unity in your prayer. I want to know, Pastor Angie, that there's fire in their prayer. Amen. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. Even if you are in a trial, if there's unity in prayer. Let's go to number eight. God's ability to deliver. God delivered them from the fiery furnace, showing his power to rescue his people. He will never let you go through a trial without providing an escape, the book of Hebrews say. You will ne never be tested beyond what you can handle. I'm so grateful for that. Because I've been in some tough 
fiery furnaces. And at times I would feel, it was just too much. I just don't think I can handle it. I'm not sure if I can. But I want to assure you tonight, you might be going through a fiery furnace experience right now. God, God has the ability to deliver you from that. Look at what the scripture says. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. And family, this speaks to the fact that the fire on the inside needs to be greater than the fire on the outside. Amen. Because I, this is what God says about us. Because he has set his love upon me. Capital M. Therefore I will deliver him. Because you love him. Because you love God. I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and I will honor him. Even though the world has dishonored you, perhaps the world has treated you badly. It says, I will deliver him and I will honor him because he knew my name in the time of trouble. The fire on the inside was greater than the fire on the outside. Amen, family. Number nine, let me activate you. The impact of faith on others. This so impacted Nebuchadnezzar, the man who was so vain, so conceited, so full of himself, that he made a golden image and everybody at the sound of any musical instrument had to bow down to this golden image. That conceited man, when he saw God in action in the lives of those three Hebrew boys, he was converted. He was changed. Look what the Bible says. Their faith and deliverance led to the conversion of King Nebuchadnezzar. My question to you is, is your faith causing people to be converted wherever you are? Let your light so shine, what Pastor Andre spoke about on week three or part three. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Just before I get there. So in other words, family, I'm talking about the fire within is to witness. The fire within is to withstand the attack of the devil. And the fire within is to win souls for the kingdom. It's one thing to witness. It's another thing to bring the souls. To make the declaration. Amen, family. So tonight, as I'm getting ready just to do one more point here. I'm asking you, how many of you are saying, Pastor Johnny, but perhaps I, 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 I'm not that bold. I'm not a Meshach uh, and all those guys. I'm, I'm not those guys. I, I, maybe I would have copped out. Maybe I would have said, no, hey, let's bow down. I want a fire on my, my trials. My fire on the outside is bigger than the fire on my inside. I need to know that this is what you, you saw the words tonight. Tonight, we, we spoke about it. No need to convince you anymore. But perhaps as a, as a point of contact tonight, I want you, if you feel, I, I would just like somebody to agree with me in prayer that, that the fire is greater in me than on the outside. And I just want to, you to lay hands on me and perhaps it's an anointing, it's an impartation that happens, okay? And I want to ask those leaders that know that they are soul winners. Only if you're a soul winner. Not if you think you want to be a soul winner. If you're a soul winner and you believe there's an anointing on your life and you're the one that's witnessing to five, six, seven, eight, ten, twenty 10, 20 people a week or a month or whatever, not once a year. Amen. We can all pick it up and I'm talking to myself. I need to pick it up. I need to get the fire on the inside bigger than the fire on the outside. Don't complain about the Olympic Games and all the horrific, disgusting things that they're doing. Let us see the fire on the inside. Don't repost the post because you're just giving credence to the devil more. But let's rather see. Don't complain about it. Let me see the fire on the inside. All you're doing is when you're complaining, you're just telling everybody, I'm in a huge fire. What about the fire on the inside? 
get your fire going on the inside. If tonight you want a touch of God, I'm going to ask those leaders that, 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 that witness to people all the time, all the evangelists, if you're witnessing to people all the time, pastors, if you're witnessing to people all the time, I want you to come forward because I want you to lay hands on the people for the impartation of that anointing. We all have received an anointing. This is part of the vision statement. God has already prepared you. No man can do it for you. It's already done. But if you just sense, I just want somebody to agree with me. Or I just want a a point of contact. Can you just lay hands on me, Pastor Johnny? Then we're going to do it. All right? Right now. So come forward right now as I go to my last point. The significance of worshiping the one true God. Family, we don't worship any woke agenda. Are you hearing me? We don't worship any woke agenda. We don't worship anything that blasphemes the name of God. There is only one God and His name is Jesus Christ. All right? Make sure that the fire on the inside is greater than the fire on the outside. I only want men and women of God that are witnessing to people. The story emphasizes family as I close. The story emphasizes the importance of worshiping only the one true God rather than idols or human leaders. Jesus is the only one that is worthy of your worship and of your praise. Thank you for watching the Christian Family Church YouTube channel. Don't stop here. Join our online community and join us live every Sunday. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream and share this with your friends. Thank you again for watching and God bless you.